Good day, everyone. It's a joy to be with you. I can see already many joining. It's wonderful to have this uh, opportunity to discuss a topic which is very profound, very important, and has an impact on all aspects of our lives. The topic mainly is the topic of the mind, our mind. What is our mind? How does the mind go through things? Does it live? Does it continue? Does it survive? This is a very powerful aspect because it is through our mind and awareness that we dream, that we feel, that we experience, that we plan, and that we create steps of progress and happiness in different fields of our life. Is the mind different from the intellect, which is our discriminating power? Is the mind and consciousness, are they the same? Is the mind different from the body? Since we have had a Cartesian approach through the times of Descartes, that defined that our reality has two values. One is the mind or consciousness. They were all mixed up. And another is the physical body and that these values, these two values are separate and independent from each other, but that somehow they talk to each other. But in modern science, we know the importance of the relationship between mind and body. And that relationship is very, very intimate. So intimate indeed that they seem to be an expression of one and the same thing, but in different ways. So the mind is actually a reflection of who we are on a level that is more abstract than who we are on the level that is more concrete, more physical, that we call our body. I'd like to start our discussion of mental survival and survival of the mind with a personal story. It is because the mind has played a very important role in my own personal life, trying to understand what it is. I went through medical school, then did research in neuroscience, in brain and cognitive science, then studied and went deep into neurology, and understood many aspects of how actually the physical body influences the mind. It's enough, of course, for you to take a drug or a medicine or have a cold, and you feel that the mind lives a different kind of experience altogether. When you have a cold, for example, which is a physical something that is happening as an inflammation in the physiology, an inflammation in the body, a stress on the body, the mind gets absolutely worked out. And you feel miserable sometimes. And you wonder, will you ever regain that feeling of health and wholeness that you had before? And so, one thing is sure, mind and body are very intimately related. Understanding the different parts of how the physiology, through the different neurons, through the different chemicals, through the different food that we have, influence the mind and can change the mind, is one aspect of knowing something about the mind. But I wanted to know more, and I was fascinated by transcendental meditation, which helps us to dive deep, remove our stresses, and have a mind which is more peaceful, and which I practiced for a long time. But I also was fascinated by the ancient knowledge that comes from the East, mainly from India, that discusses the mind that has researched the mind in a very profound way. Nowadays, meditation and yoga is very common. And all of this comes from this ancient Vedic tradition that has had a really scientific approach to the study of the mind, but from a subjective perspective, from a perspective that is introspective, which means looking within and trying techniques as yoga and meditation and different procedures to understand the mind and consciousness and how they develop and how they allow us to make decisions, 
to be happy, to grow, to evolve in our lives, and also how situations and circumstances, particularly in uncertain times, create stress and strain that ultimately lead to disease even in the human physiology. Today, we also live sometimes, and particularly during this pandemic, in quite uncertain times. Situations have changed for us. There is confinement, there is wearing masks, there is all kinds of constraints that are put on our freedom, on our ability to be happy, to choose things, to be secure about our future. So today we want to deal with all of this. But first I want to highlight my personal experience that will illustrate some aspects of what we will discuss today. This experience is my own experience after finishing all my studies and going to uh, investigate and study and understand more consciousness and the mind with the person I felt comes from the purest tradition of Veda, this ancient tradition of yoga and meditation, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. So I was lucky to join Maharishi and learned so much from him and was living at that time in a perfect state of fulfillment, of happiness, so much that I felt that even death doesn't scare me, that I could even die for myself, there is no problem, because I felt this unbounded inner fullness, inner feeling of goodness, except for others, maybe who depend on me in some ways, uh, I really felt so invincible until I had this little experience. One night, uh, sleeping normally like any other night, in the Netherlands, where Marshi was not far, in the same building, we were, we were there with many of the scientists. This is what we call the Maharishi European Research University, where we have centers there that are teaching and doing research and spreading knowledge. Uh, I felt in the night I was sleeping, I started to feel something falling on my face. I felt at the beginning as if I was dreaming, but then some big chunk of something fell on my face and it turned out to be a piece of paint and then a big stone that fell on the side and the whole room was rumbling and moving. So obviously I understood it was an earthquake. We had that earthquake and we all ran out and I had that same equanimity of feeling of being invincible and that we did the right thing and that is over. We waited a little bit outside and we're sitting somewhere on the outer value and then suddenly came the aftershock tremors and there were these tremors that happened and my mind was very quiet my consciousness was serene in some way, but I felt something in my body that was not happy. I actually felt very deep fear that I've never experienced before. It looks like an ancient old kind of fear that came up in my physiology and then colored actually my mind. I knew it was fear. I know I was afraid and I was of course afraid of death. I was afraid of uh, losing my life. Although my mind and my intellect were analyzing the situation and trying to be aloof and remembering <laughs> that I am invincible, that I am this and that, but my body was afraid, my body was scared and it impacted my mind and my intellect and awaken this sense. So what happened really is the sense of self was afraid of loss, was afraid of death. What I did is something unusual, but I had learned this from Marishi, who said that when one is under these situations of not fear from the sense of real fear of a real problem, but of a sense of anxiety, of a fear of the unknown uh, or anger or such kind of negative feelings, one of the things you can do is put your attention on the body. And so I sat down, closed my eyes and simply allowed my attention to go on the body. And I felt some places where 
the fear was actually coming from. There is some tension as your stomach is, uh, you know, cramped or different part of the body is stressed and strained. And by having the attention gradually on the body, rather on the mind going crazy about what will happen, how it's going to happen, what is the situation and the conflict between my intellect and my sense of continuity, yet my philosophy and all of that, and the conflict with the body that actually was feeling pain of fear. And having this attention on the body rather than on the mind, on the content of the mind, released the tension and gradually I came back to my senses and everything went well. Now what this tells me is that we have a reality, and this is something we know, that, uh, that has and contains many layers. There is the layer of our body, our physical body. There is the layer of our energy, our what maintains us, our breathing, our activities that actually help to maintain the body and the mind. There is the mind itself. There is the intellect which decides and discriminates because it's the intellect that moved me into making something and making, taking a decision that is helpful and positive. And there is ultimately the self which witnesses that but can feel also uh, what is happening in different parts of the body, in different parts of the intellect, the mind, and all the energy values. So the tips that we will be discussing today about the survival of the mind will take us to all these values, these five different areas of our reality. Of course, it's simplified because we might be seeing in ourselves so many other dimensions of feelings, of relationships, etc. But we experience those through different, different values that are categorized and summarized in these five areas. This is consistent with uh, neuro endocrine regulation with neurophysiology, with brain and cognitive science, that these different aspects of activity of the body and its different values, and then the mind, and then the, the breathing, and then the different vital organs and vital places are actually controlled by different parts of the nervous system, starting from the very basic control of the autonomic nervous system, which is already quite developed, then going into the middle parts of the hypothalamus, then, then the protective parts of the, of the limbic system, and then the higher parts which are in the cortical values. But without going into the scientific discussions right now, we can see that even in the Vedic tradition, in the ancient tradition, these were divided into different layers. In the ancient Upanishads, which is part of the wholeness of the Veda, the Vedantic aspect. Veda, by the way, means knowledge. It's the ancient knowledge that uh, comes from the ancient traditions, many thousand years old, and from which actually yoga and meditation come, has that description of these layers as being the first layer of the body, which is Annamaya Kosha, it's called. Then the second layer is the Pranamaya Kosha, that which sustains, maintains, gives energy and allows the body to continue. Then there is the Manomaya Kosha, which is the, the layer of the mind. And then the Vigyanmaya Kosha, that layer of knowledge and discrimination and decision making. And then there is this Kosha, which is a layer of the self, living in ananda and bliss that covers the ultimate self, which is pure being, pure consciousness, as we will discuss. Every aspect of these layers has to be nourished. In the same way as our mind and body are interconnected and require that there is balance both in how the mind works and how the body works, both also need nourishment. The physiology needs nourishment through food. The mind also needs nourishment. The intellect needs nourishment. The self needs nourishment. And these are the values that help us to maintain balance and strength. Because these five areas of our reality that we are considering 
are deeply interconnected. What happens in the mind influences the body. What happens in the body influences the mind. Now, there are things that stay in our DNA, in our awareness, in our reality, even from time to time throughout the ages, such as, for example, the fear from earthquake. Animals, when they feel something like this, even they've never experienced earthquake before, they'll be all running in herds. Babies, for example, are afraid of heights. Even they've never fallen, they've never had a problem of height. They move and there are experiments like this that show that inherent within our system, there are certain fears that stayed with us from the times of our evolution throughout the history of human evolution from different, different perspectives of where the humans were and how they become where they are. So there are two things that we can discuss that are very fundamental in these five aspects that are very important. One is stability. We need stability. We need reference. And the other is novelty. We need to evolve. We need to grow. So on the side of stability, we have things that are familiar, that are repetitive, that are the same, that give us the sense of continuity in our life. If we don't have the sense of stability and continuity, then we are like a football being tossed around by situations and circumstances. So we need strength, stability, and discipline in that sense. What we need also is novelty, creativity, so that we feel we are evolving. Because if you take a statue that's made out of stone, it is very stable, but it's useless. It is not evolving. It is stagnant. So if we don't have these two values, and these two values at all levels of the five areas that we discussed, then we are uh, feeling that we are not surviving in a proper way. We are not growing. We are not expanding our reality and we feel either anxiety or depression or all kinds of problems. So let's take one layer by layer and one area by area and look at what we can do for this stability and novelty and creativity. If you take food, for example, which is what nourishes the body, it is very important that you have regularity in food. So put the time of eating in a regular place. You eat better to eat regularly because the physiology then feels at home. It feels comforted. It feels accepted. It feels taken care of. And that is a very rigid routine, we can say. Of course, it's not so rigid that you cannot eat if you're hungry or you travel, etc. But for having a sense of stability and strength on the physical level even, on the biological level, regularity is very important. Now, how can we have novelty within regularity? That is very, very important also. We do not eat the same things all the time. That's very important. Variety is very important for the body. It's very important for the taste, for the good feeling, but it's also important for the nourishment of the physiology because different ingredients of food have different nourishing values. Now, these are very important concepts. If you say, what do I eat? What should I eat? Of course, depends on your likings, depends on uh, your feelings. You want to be vegetarian, you want to be uh, vegan, you want to eat other things. Uh, you want to be on the ketogenic diet or this or that. This is your choice that you decide with your doctor, with your coaches. But the main thing in this that we suggest is also to follow a routine that is in tune with natural law, in tune with the changes of seasons. Uh, although you will eat same time at the middle of the day is usually the best time for lunch, for example and like that, not to eat too late in the evening. These things we can find in what we discussed already in Ayurveda. Uh, we had a seminar like this, a webinar, where we discussed the preferences of food and how you can choose them. 
Now, in general, we can say try to avoid inflammatory foods. There are studies that show that purified sugar and highly processed food are inflammatory to the system and they don't help, they can create changes in mood. So we know that the food itself already has a great effect on our mood, on our uh, uh, mind and how it, uh, it uh, behaves and how it recognizes things. You know that if you've not eaten a right thing or eaten something bad, you might feel bad. And sometimes the mind is, why am I not feeling so good today? I'm depressed. You try to find something mental as if something has happened to, with somebody and it, it made you feel, you know, why is, what is the reason I'm not feeling good? And oftentimes you will feel that you have not been good in your diet, you've eaten the wrong things, your digestion is not working well. So that is the area of the surface superficial gross, most gross value of our reality, which is our body. On the other side, we have this value, which is the energy value that gives us sustenance and supports us. And in the Vedic tradition, the ancient yogic tradition and this the tradition of uh, meditation and yoga, there is a, something important which is called pranayama. Pranayama is a technique. I, I also have done a series on pranayama that you can see on Facebook and Instagram. But to give you a simple direct experience of that is very simple. You sit comfortably straight. You close the eyes and you take your thumb, put it on your nostril on one side and you breathe out with the other nostril. Then you breathe in with the same nostril and you close that second nostril with these two fingers, the two middle fingers. You close that and now you breathe out from the first one and then in again. And you do this comfortably, easily with having your attention on the breath. So you're mindful of the breathing and you can feel when the energy is coming. After all, this is the prana, which means the energy of life. And it brings uh, support and oxygen to the physiology. And then when you're breathing out, is you're breathing away all stresses and strains. You can think about that if you, if you like, but best is to follow that sequence that we have had uh, in the uh, pranayama and different styles of breathing. So you can do this few minutes a day. What this helps is sustain the body and gives reassurance that everything is okay. Because when there is stress and strain, we start breathing in all kinds of ways that are stressful. We start breathing with the upper muscles of the body. We forget that there is a diaphragmatic breathing. And so breathe easily, deeply, and regularly, and this can be very helpful, and have your mind on this following up what is happening in the breathing. So this is the pranamaya kosha, the second layer of the energy and the simple technique that can help. The third one is related to the mind. The mind itself also needs nourishment, and that it will need with different activities that you can do that are enjoyable, you can uh, have fun with movies, with uh, seeing beautiful things, with hearing beautiful things. And a simple thing to do is to try every day to see something beautiful. As much as you are living and rushing through life, we usually are not used to being held back at home and now many aspects are confined and restricted and we feel angry because there is no novelty, there is no creativity. And so what you want to do is see things that are beautiful, hear things that are beautiful and different kinds of things, things that are inspiring, that I have life supporting, that are uplifting. And these things can be as simple as a beautiful flower, a beautiful uh, experience of the sunrise and like that uh, take time to do things and experience things and remember things that have happened to you in the past that are fulfilling and also think of others not just of your one self but 
also what can you do to others that can bring happiness because that will expand the mind and make it feel more secure and don't be afraid to do things and to plan things that are positive, that are strong, that are great, that are big. And even if you fail, don't feel harsh about yourself. One has to learn to accept the failure. It is better to act, to do things, to plan things, think of your life, think of what you want to do, make a decision of being big, as big as possible, and see how you can work it out and make it happen. And the mind will enjoy these values from the level of creativity, of continuity, of connectedness that gives stability because when you help others, you are feeling connected to others, you're feeling one with others. On the level of the intellect, uh, be creative, uh, write a book, uh, write your memoirs, plan your life again, think of things in a positive way, learn something new. You can learn a game, you can learn chess, you can learn uh, something that is interesting that makes you think and think in a way that is requiring uh, analysis and deduction and that will help also the, the intellect to be, to be holy and full. On the level of the self, what is most important is to go back to the self, is to come back to oneself. We usually run around and are constantly having our attention on things that are outside ourselves, And when they are outside of ourselves, we feel like we're busy, we're taken by friends, what they think, what they do, uh, what they see us, how we want to, you know, to be with them. And then whenever we have a minute or something when we are alone, we tend to turn the TV on, we turn to, to drink, we went to alcohol, we are kind of escaping from things. We don't want to escape from anything. What we want is, if we want to go out for something intellectual, something of the mind, we want to seek things. So seek, but do not escape. Because the difference is that it is you who are doing the action, rather you being drawn around by different situations and circumstances. So it's very important to go back to the self. And the most important way to go back to the self and actually help all of the other aspects that can be said to be on, on certain ways more superficial because they hide the true essence of life is to experience the self. Experience the self directly and that is the beauty of transcendental meditation. Transcendental meditation also has these aspects. It is very regular. It gives us the assurance of regularity. So when we, did, we meditate morning and evening, sorry, there's, that is, there is that reference back to regularity where we feel at home. We go back to uh, a stable uh, aspect, which is ourself, and we do it regularly. We experience that. And it also has novelty because no two experiences of meditation are the same, of transcendental meditation. And if you learn this technique, if you've learned it, practice it very regularly because it gives that sense of being anchored in the self. So there is that strength and stability. And it gives that sense of greater awareness, greater novelty, greater discovery of the self. And the self grows and expands and the stresses are released. And as clarity comes and dawns, the intellect is clearer you can know better how to choose. The mind is more creative. The body and the energy of the body is increased and improved. The metabolism is improved. And the whole body is strong and feels good. And these are not just uh, hopeful, wishful thinking. These are things that have been studied scientifically in a very profound way and that have given us really a very important technique and technology to develop the full potential of all the areas of our life in the best possible way. Before we close, I want to invite you to something that will satisfy the mind and the intellect 
and that is an event by the David Lynch Foundation. You can check it out on meditateamerica.org and uh, join it. It's on December the 3rd. It will give entertainment with great leaders, successful people who will have intellect and heart and mind and beautiful things happening. Such kind of variety and uh, entertainment is very, very helpful and very nourishing. So these are in brief the different thoughts. We took a little longer than 20, 25 minutes, but I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. I can see there are some that are coming. I see from Canada, Iran, Irani asks, what can I do about the feelings of injustice that I fear regarding the world? The news doesn't help. Any suggestions? Very important that indeed there are things that we will see that are not very uh, fulfilling or inspiring. And we can change the world. That is the key to the answer to the solution. How we change the world? We change the world first by changing ourselves, by having inner stability within ourselves, And how do we do that? By transcending, meaning going beyond the surface changing value to that value which is our true self within us and which is anchored in the unbounded field of what we call the unified field of natural law. And when we change ourselves, we are automatically changing society and there are studies that have shown that when a group of people or a number of people practice transcendental meditation together, uh, the advanced techniques also of the cities and raising their consciousness, then there have been transformation in society on the level of crime, uh, prosperity improves, crime and conflict decrease. And so these are the most powerful ways to really change our world. Otherwise, be as strong, as clear as you can yourself, improve yourself so that you have the best strength, the best equipment, the best machinery, mind, body and intellect to deal with the situation and to go above it and make steps of evolution that are most constructive and most helpful for yourself and for others. Pinky Cole says, why can't everyone learn meditation? Well, there are different kinds of meditation. Of course, there are these techniques of mindfulness where you put your attention on different parts of the body. And what I uh, uh, taught you, these two techniques of pranayama is also can be accompanied by this mindfulness technique. It's very simple. All you need to do is breathing and have your attention on one side and then the other side as you, f you follow the breath. And that is very softening and very calming. There are uh, techniques where you put your attention on everything. For example, we said food when you eat. So when you eat, taste the food. Take your time to taste the food. What taste does it have? What uh, feeling does it give you? Is it sour? Is it sweet? Is it soothing to you? You know, so be aware of what you're experiencing. Now, this awareness of what you're experiencing, you can help by guiding the mind through the intellect to do it. But if your mind is settled and you are not stressed and you are established in yourself, then naturally you will have this experience of things. When I said experience the flower, experience the sunrise, see that these simple things of life can be beautiful and can have certain things, then really joy can come. Put your attention on that which is good. Whatever you put your attention on grows stronger in your life. If you put your attention too much on negativity and on stress and the way people are showing things, maybe they are showing things in a certain way because they are wearing yellow glasses and then they see everything yellow. Maybe another wears red glasses and they see everything red. What you want is to have clear glasses so that you see things as they are. And life is marvelous and beautiful and 
we can make it better, of course, it needs to be improved by gaining that clarity of vision, that clarity of thinking, which comes from removal of stress. And that happens with transcendental meditation, which is the most advanced technique of meditation that actually allows us to transcend. And this technique is extremely simple. Even children from the age of five, they can do it. Adults, people of all walks of life, and everybody is able to do it. So there are techniques of concentration, of contemplation, and, and mindfulness in a way that is manipulating and guiding the mind. This can feel or sound difficult for some people, but transcendental meditation, in my experience and the experience of millions of people, is extremely simple and easy to practice. So try that and you will not say anymore that meditation is difficult. Uh, I have Leila wants to know what should our daily priorities be at this time? I think we have to have these two values, rest and activity, stability and novelty, and have the priorities in all these values. When you are thinking of a routine for food, make it a good routine. Routine for sleep, sleep on time. Very important to sleep before a certain hour because the body gains maximum strength in that. So these are simple things. Of course, there are big priorities in terms of changing the world and doing something very profound to ourselves and society. And that I would again say it is first starts with the self, which means transcend, get away from, from the hustle and bustle. If you are not part of it, if it's not your business, <laughs> then don't feel drawn by it. Go back to the self. People say, but is that not selfish? It's not selfish because we can only give what we have. If you have happiness, if you have strength, then you can give strength and happiness. So our first responsibility is towards ourself. And then when we have that self developed, that strength developed, then we can help others. So if we want to give maximum to others, we have to be maximum. If we are tired, if we are stressed, if we are sad, then when somebody comes, we will just emanate and give this sadness and this tiredness. So this doesn't help others. Therefore, the priority is gain strength, gain clarity, and then you will see what is best to do for yourself based on your own vocation in life, based on your own uh, talents that you will develop to the maximum, based on your own desires. So what we need is clear vision, clear thinking, stable interior, and use that equipment that we have, which is our physiology, our brain, our mind, our intellect, in the best possible way to help everyone and help ourselves in the best possible ways we can, we can. So Michelle is asking about the cycle of depression and anxiety and what can help. Uh, it depends on the situation and how strong it is. Um, it is natural. This is one thing we have to know. Everybody goes through these cycles. So if you go sometimes through cycles where you are very strong and happy and up and all of that. And then there are periods where we are down or there are periods where we are anxious and in a regular way, but then we come up from it and then we feel depressed. Then this is part of the natural cycles that can happen if we are not truly clearing up our system from its stresses and strains. So people who practice transcendental meditation, they experience much less anxiety, much less depression, and this has been studied scientifically. So I urge you to learn, to learn this technique and then be able to enjoy more stability. So you can have these waves and then they plateau and then you go up and then they plateau. Now, in terms of practical things, again, what you need is stability, reference. It's like going home, going back home. When one is anxious, it's usually somebody who feels they are lost. They are afraid of something and they don't know what it is. 
They have bad expectations of things. And that happens when we are not feeling at home with ourselves. Now, home, of course, is a place where we say home, sweet home, because it's the place that is familiar. So there is familiarity. And if we've had good experiences in our home and have been familiar with it, we feel that sense of stability and strength. Not all of us have good experiences at home. Some people have to go through difficult conditions at home, but they can find the home within. They can find the home that is uh, stability, that is unbounded, that is within ourselves, And that is the beauty of going back to the self, of transcending. This is the reality of life, that everything on the surface comes from one unified field that then manifests as energy fields and then particles, atoms, molecules, organs, organ systems, human beings and society. But ultimately everything comes from that field. That field is a field of consciousness according to the ancient Vedic tradition and yogic tradition, Vedantic tradition, and that is who we truly are. So ultimately, knowing what we are in a true way, know thyself, gives us that strength and energy and clarity and confidence to face adversity, but able to handle it and get above it. If you have anxiety issues that are more serious, uh, then there are different ways to deal with it. Uh, some important ways are uh, not to be afraid to act. This is very important. You're going to have a lecture, for example, and you're feeling anxious in the lecture. Don't be afraid to fail. Say, I'm going to do it. The main thing is to go and do it. It doesn't matter. That sense of actually doing it is very important. And uh, it will show you that actually often you can do it without a problem. And you might start a little by stuttering or something. And then just go back to your mind, go to yourself and do it. If you want to write a book and you're anxious, you don't feel you're writing the book, you're able to do it. Don't try to write a perfect book. Just start writing. Just start. That is very important, to start things. Otherwise, we are sitting there and afraid and not feeling good about starting and all of that. Oftentimes, you have something to take care of. And when you start it, it starts and it rolls and you enjoy it and it continues. But the start can be difficult. So learn how to start things. Learn how to get yourself into starting and not listening to, you know, the thoughts that are delaying you, that are scaring you. And like this, by accomplishing things and doing things, and thinking of others also and helping others also, you feel you're growing, you feel your sense of self grows because now others are kind of part of yourself and that will help you in all these areas. But ultimately the technique that is most effective is transcendental meditation. And of course, if one has advanced issues, one should consult with one's doctor or, or see if there is a need for more attention. Laura Wiarda's question is, you talk about fear of earthquakes embedded in the physiology. How does this same fear of speaking in groups relate? This is a very important point, and I wanted to also deal with it and give a comparison. Sometimes uh, these fears, uh, they are already embedded in us, and we transpose them transpose the ancient memory of the fear to different situations. For example, people can be annoyed and become anxious and fearful from noise or, you know, cars driving or heights or different situations and circumstances. And what this is, in a way, if we want to compare to earthquake, Earthquake is fearful because it's a threat to your life and you feel like you can't do anything about it and it's the whole earth is shaking, it's a huge thing and somewhat 
it was imprinted in our memory and, and we transmitted this memory from generation to generation. Like we said, the animals that are scared, the babies that are scared of heights, etc. And what happens is sometimes lack of stability, lack of familiarity becomes equivalent in our mind with insecurity and fear. So we transpose uh, this unknown, the factor of unknown, to other things that have been imprinted in our memory. So maybe the original fear was from earthquake, but the earthquake is because of insecurity, unknown of what is going to happen next. And then we find ourselves in a situation where there is some insecurity, we don't know what's going to happen next, and somehow the whole physiology understand this as if it is kind of an earthquake. I give this example just to elaborate how this can happen. And therefore we oftentimes fool ourselves with small values that lead us to believe there is a danger to my life and this is how the fear comes. And what we need is these examples that we have taken. When you have good routine, when you have stability, when you have familiarity, when you're able to sleep on time, when you're able to eat on time, when you're able to do your exercise in time, which is something I didn't mention, but it's very important and it's good I'm reminded. It's part of the tips that we have to take care of. It's good exercise and regular exercise, but again, not the same exercise all the time, which is also kind of novelty, but stability. Stability in the routine, novelty in the kind of exercise, so different muscles are awakened, different parts of the body are awakened, otherwise it becomes boring and we stop doing it. So this regularity, this uh, stability is very important and novelty also because it gives us a sense of growth, we are evolving, life is giving us something new and we are learning something new, which is part of the nature of life and that is to grow and evolve. So thank you all for joining us and uh, for all our friends who are having a Thanksgiving. Have a great Thanksgiving and uh, no matter what the circumstances, stay safe but <clears throat> enjoy. There are ways to enjoy now. That is another aspect of our stability and strength and that is to have our friends be with us, to have our familiar people, family and friends be able to gather. So if you're not able to come together in a safe way, then come together through the digital means, through conferencing and enjoy these different values of life. And again, I'd like to remind you of meditateamerica.org, which is the David Lynch Foundation uh, celebration, which would be very enjoyable on December 3rd. Thank you for joining. Have a great Thanksgiving and a great time. And happy holidays if we don't meet for this end of the year.